Um, my name is Mark Hatley. Um, I work for Wind River, and they've given me the opportunity to work on some licensing things, specifically uh, integrating the SPDX format, which Wind River is behind and a member of the SPDX group, into the Octo project for automated machine uh, generation of licenses, as well as related things um, to be able to help track software licensing and things eventually. So some of you may have been in at ELC this spring when a little bit of this was presented, but that was before we had actual code. Some of you may have seen two years ago where I presented a prototype where it was a prototype and it was nothing that ever went in because it wasn't, it wasn't useful from that. It was just a proof of concept to see. We are finally beyond the proof of concept stage. So if you have seen any of those presentations, please bear with me. I'm going to re-explain for about the first 15 minutes all of the problems that people are having so that you have the context to understand why we did what we did and what the direction is moving forward. So to start with, these are my opinions. I am not a lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice. If you have a question, contact your own lawyers. Um, however, I'm happy to tell you about what I think the way things should work and the way that um, we have implemented various features and why. So here's my disclaimer so that my company does not get mad at me because this is work that they allowed me to do. It is not work that they asked me to do, which is a nice opportunity. Um, so just to introduce what we're talking about, there's really two projects going on here. There's the Yocto project, which most people are familiar with by this point. It's the, it's the cross-development build system to create a distribution for a custom distribution for an embedded operating system. Um, and then we have the SPDX. And all the SPDX is, is it's a standard interchange format that allows you to, or allows somebody to specify the licensing for the individual files as well as the software as a whole for a package or a source code packages. Um, the big thing there is it's finally a specification like PDF so that everybody can look at it and go, okay, at least I understand what these fields mean. Now we have to get the right data into those fields. We have to have enough people using it to get enough momentum so that we can actually make it useful over time. And the momentum's been the hardest part with the licensing. Everybody wants licensing. Nobody wants to do the work because nobody else has done the work yet. So hopefully this will help bootstrap some of that process. So first thing, what problem are we actually trying to solve? So what is the software license of your product? What makes up? Is it open source? Is it proprietary? Did you write it yourselves? Did you contract it out to somebody? Did they use code they shouldn't have? Did they link to code that, that they didn't realize they were linking to, which may have license ramifications? The end question is, what are your actual obligations when you ship a product? So example, BusyBox. It's obvious, GPL2, right? Well, no. Because if you actually look at the source code to BusyBox, you will see that they copied sources from other things to make their own package. So is it GPL 2.0? Only your lawyer can actually answer that, but this can help. So BusyBox, like I said, is interesting because it consists of files from many projects. An example, signal file says I'm GPL 2. The run shell file says I'm an MIT license. The math file says I'm a GPL2, but I'm also a BSD3 clause, and I'm also an MIT license. So why does this matter? Well, when you compile BusyBox, you're going to compile those three items, and of course many more, into your application. And so your application inherits the source code licenses. And so in essence, you now have this wonderful map, and you have to put it together and explain to your lawyers what software I'm using and what the actual license is, which gets you down to this the actual license for that particular configuration, you have to meet the requirements of all of these licenses together, each of the individual software licenses. And so, what you would get in an SPDX format is the individual files for a particular configuration would look something like this. You would also get an, something that indicates the maintainer declared this as GPL version two which definitely matters what the maintainer of the package thinks it is because they're one of the people that would go and cause a problem if you did not meet the obligation. And finally, there's a concluded by whoever reviewed the license, which would probably be your legal organization. And in this particular case, with this particular configuration, it's roughly agreed that it is GPL version two is what you have to meet in order to release this configuration. Fairly simple example on a fairly complex package. So, now we look at your actually 
here's your file system image that's made up of all these components, which is part of a product, which also has a bootloader and a kernel, and suddenly you now have a wider mess. How do you coordinate all of these things together to figure out what the actual software um, information is for your product as a whole? And that's really why the SPDX was there. We've got to have a common interchange so that we can create tools to help automate this because we have to bridge the gap between engineering language, um, legal language, um, our marketing departments, um, and anybody else who's involved in these things. So quick overview of what the SPDX files themselves actually contain. There's really five sections here. Um, the specification information, just which version of SPDX are we using, and a little bit of information around that. Who created the individual file that we're looking at. And then the actual stuff that we care about, which is the packaging information, the file information, individual file information, and the license and licenses that it found in the system. So I'm only going to give you an example of, the, of what I think is the important information, such as the package. Um, this is one I actually pulled out of uh, some Zlib automation. And as you can see, uh, the system said this is where I downloaded it from. It says no assertion. And the reason why is it was automatically generated by a system. And the system cannot assume what um, the license is. It can't conclude it. Only a person can conclude it. So no assertion is the default. The declared license is what the package itself said, hey, I am a, and it's license reference zero and license reference one, which we don't know what that means. So eventually, I will show you that uh, it is defined in the bottom of the document. The next section of the document is the individual file information. Uh, it tells you the file type, source, binary. Um, there's theoretically some other types that you can put in there, but source or binary is really what you pick. And then the file, the license for that file as determined. Um, again, concluded is something the, a, an automated system would not do. That would be a reviewer would do that. Check some to verify that if that file changes, we know we have to re-review the licenses. Copyright text that was found in it, as well as finally the file name in that package. And now here's the magic license information. So the license information itself says, I found a file, or the system did. It says, please see the online publication. Well, that's not terribly useful in terms of this. So a reviewer would go in, read that text, and say, OK, I need to go find what they're talking about, read it in context, make a determination, and they would end up probably manually changing this section. Um, then the extracted text it says, GPL, something, something, something. OK, this is probably GPL. So the system pulls out and says, OK, Zlib has something in it that's GPL and something in it that is likely a Zlib license. And again, the reviewer is the one that's got to make the determination at the end. Most likely what I'm used to seeing is this GPL reference in something like Zlib isn't the license of the overall software. It's the license for configure or config.guess or so, something along those lines. And that's when you as an engineer need to work with your legal organization to explain to them, no, really the thing that says GPL here is never used on the target. We never actually deploy that component. It's only used for building. That helps them make a determination on whether or not um, you need to meet the GPL on this particular package. Okay, so gave you an introduction on what the SPDX is, but how do you actually generate it? Um, there's really three ways. There's a good way. It's good enough for most people to get started, and that's the automated machine generated way. License information is generated cheaply. We can process thousands and thousands of files. Computer just goes off and does it in a corner. It doesn't matter. It just takes some electricity. However, it's only good. We need a better answer. And the better answer is human comes in, looks at the output of the automated machine, machines, verifies it, resolves any of those things that I just mentioned. Like it says that there's a license somewhere else I should go view. They go view it, read it, interpret it, and then handle that. But they don't actually look at every single file in the system. The best thing, though, from a legal perspective, I have been told, is that um, the humans should look at every single file, interpret every single license statement, copyright statement, in context of the source code, and make a determination for every single file. However, best is unlikely to happen, simply because it is incredibly time consuming. So the reality of the situation is, you're going to probably generate the stuff automatically. You're going to have somebody with knowledge review the questions. And then if there's a, a component that is questionable, does not have good licensing statement, that's when a human would come in and review the lines individually. 
So machine generated is really what I'm talking about today. And the best way to do that today is physiology. Um, the physiology is uh, a thing, if you're not familiar with it, that was contributed by HP a while back, and I think they're on version three or four now, that um, goes in, does pattern matching, does scanning for keywords, uh, things like that through the source code, and identifies the licensing for the components. Physiology does not output SPDX natively. Physiology just goes and does it, generates a report and the metadata that you would use in order to build the components. Um, but the University of, of Nebraska, Omaha, went and they have a research grant that allowed them to create a module for Physiology that allowed them to generate SPDX based on the output of Physiology. And so that's what the Physiology SPDX project is. Um, again, real-time scanning using Physiology with an output that is in an SPDX format or can be easily transformed into an SPDX format. And it's important whether it's SPDX or transformable because SPDX is very text-based. It's difficult to process in some ways. So they um, use a JSON format or the plain text format. The examples I showed were plain text. But the JSON format is simply much easier to uh, process by, auto by automated tools so that you can then convert it into SPDX or do further processing on it. I'll go back. Uh, at the bottom, if you're interested, is the actual Physiology uh, SPDX project, and this is their API. Um, one of the things I want to mention about the Physiology SPDX, and I didn't realize this going in, because uh, I've been working with these guys for a while, is um, they're not the CS engineers that you're used to traditionally coming in and working on things like this. The physiology guys are being trained um, at the University of Nebraska Omaha into information sciences. How do I process the data? How do I find the data? How do I turn it into something that's useful? And so the components and the way that it's implemented right now, if you put it in that context, it's actually very good. Um, however, if you look at it from a CS person, there isn't a lot of multitasking. There isn't a lot of parallelization and, very, and a lot of the components are very, very linear. And so this is where we come in as engineers and say, you know what, it would be better and faster if you made the following changes. And they may come back as, as the maintainer of the project and go, yeah, but I don't really know how to do that. And then, of course, the open source kicks in and we contribute and everything else. And so this is an open source project. So let's go back to the Octo project. This is really why I'm here. <laughs> The build system, if you are not familiar with the Octo project, is roughly this. Um, standard embedded build system starts with fetching the source code, goes in, patches the application, configures, compiles, installs into a temporary directory, we then process the output, create some packages, move on, eventually create images. Very, very basic stuff. One of the things that's important to figure out is where in this process do we need to capture that source code? We could capture it right after the source fetching, but as soon as we patch it or modify it, then we, really, we have to go back and do it again. And so what we came up with with an answer is instead of doing it on the raw sources, we patch the sources, and then we add a new function into this, which is the SPDX generator. That way we're always verifying the sources based on the patched version, and, the, and within the OE core environment, the patched version may be different from one machine to another based on various configuration options. And so we know we're always doing the one that will end up being compiled, will end up being transformed into binaries at some point. So the do SPDX function that was added is added via a BB class, which if you're familiar with the system, you simply add it using user class SPDX, adds it in, it's automatically added in the correct order to the build system. Um, the test plugs in, makes sure, and, and the rough areas that it does, and again, this is very a linear process because that's what you do when you do data processing, it's very linear. Um, clean up all log files, you create some temporary information, you get the SPDX from a local cache if you have it. If you don't have it, that's when you have to prepare it for sending up to a remote server, or potentially a remote server. Um, you then uh, tar up the sources that were not in the cache, you then send them to the Physiology SPDX server, wait, data comes uh, back after it's been scanned, you then process that JSON data and you store a copy of the JSON, you process it and you also store it off as an SPDX so that it can be modified by other tools. And then you just clean up after yourself. So this is their official 
um, there being the University of uh, North Carolina, uh, not North Carolina, sorry, University of Nebraska Omaha. Um, this is what they're working off of. Simple, very, very simple, but at some point in the thing, we break in, we do the SPDX processing, we send it off, scan it, come back, or we pull from the cache, or we do both in order to get the data through. Eventual output is the SPDX or the manifester, and the manifester is simply the, the cached information. So here's an example of something that was actually generated through the SPDX system. Um, in this particular case, uh, you can see that the versions SPDX1, the data license, in other words, the license of this SPDX file was set as Creative Commons. Um, we've got some very basic documentation that says what this is. We have the creator, Sology SPDX, when it was created and who created it. Um, get in the package information, get in the file information, and eventually there will be the license information that was pulled out by the Phasology SPDX system. Okay, so what, let's talk what this actually is. In the Octo Project 1.5, we did add this during the development. It is not release quality. This is the first step towards getting something that's going to be useful. So I consider it to be a prototype, maybe even beta quality in some mind. However, what's in the release right now does not work if you just pull it out and try to activate it. You have to apply a few patches on top of it, and those patches will go into the um, Yocta Project 501, re or, sorry, 151 release, uh, which will be in a few weeks. Um, basically, to enable it, you need to set up a Phasology server. You then have to add the uh, Phasology SPDX module. It's very important to know about the SPDX modules that you have to make sure you set Apache so that it can access enough memory. Because if you're processing um, GCC sources, for instance, you can end up uh, needing seven, 800 megs of memory for a single PHP process to run, which for a normal web service would be denial of service. You wouldn't want that. But for Phasology, you may have to have that, that ability. Timeouts also matter. It can take three, four, 500 minutes to process a GCC, whereas it takes 30 seconds to process Bash. And so you've got to have enough timeout time in there. Um, and there's other configurations. They're all in the documentation for the Phasology SPDX, but based on how it's implemented right now, this would work fine internal to a company, but I would not want to expose a server. It would leave the server itself open to too many denial of service attacks. Um, the other thing why I consider this to be prototype and beta quality is the Phasology SPDX module is very linear in how it processes, and the Phasology system itself is also very linear how it processes. Phasology has a scheduler, but the scheduler only works on a package basis. And so the, the scheduling gets the same amount of scheduling priority if I send it bash, which is a few hundred files, or GCC, which is 500,000 files. And so you send the data up to get processed, and it uh, finds a node, finds something available to process it, starts processing, and it processes file one, then two, then three, then four. And so it's a very long process no matter how, how fast your machines are. And so if you're going to be doing this in the near term, you definitely need to have a very fast I.O. machine. You need to have a lot of memory, and I recommend using a RAM disk if possible for the, uh, for the Phasology uh, SPDX side. The other thing to enable, like I mentioned before, is add the SPDX module to our SPDX BB class to your user classes configuration. And finally, configure the settings for the SPDX class. Um, if you look in the MetaConf license file, at the bottom of the file is all of the information that explains how to configure it. At some point, we will add this to the documentation for the project, but it's simply too new at this point. Okay, real world results. What did I test? Uh, how did I get this? So I set up a Phasology machine, which was, it's a little bit older, uh, Intel Xeon with uh, three gigahertz, eight core, um, 48 gigs of RAM, and I did use the RAM disk after initially trying the RAID, and it gave me about a 10 to 20% performance boost by going to the RAM disk. Um, build machine, uh, if you notice, uh, the build machine is actually a little bit more powerful by cores, but when I figured out that it wasn't really multitasking, I wanted the, the three gigahertz versus the 2.8. More RAM, etc. And the other thing you'll notice in my build machine is it is intentionally very old. It's Fedora 13, and the reason why is when I do builds, I want to make sure that the build system is not impacting what uh, what we're processing. And I also built Core Image Minimal, which is one of the smallest um, images that uh, is just a default template out of the uh, the Octa Project OE Core. 
So like I said before, it's prototype quality. It didn't work right out of the box, so I had to make a few changes just to get it to work. Um, two of the first changes here are, came from the University of, Nor of Nebraska. Um, additional license information processing, what this does is it knows about some additional tags that come down from the server and gets them uh, transformed into the right settings. And finally, the JSON. Um, originally, when this was implemented and added to uh, the Octo project, it was in a tag format, not a JSON, and it was very, very difficult to do the data transforms as we needed. And so they, um, they quickly made the change, but it was too late to get that patch into the Octo project uh, for the 1.5 release. And um, so I had to add that, that patch into the system, and that, like I said, should be in the 1.5.1. Uh, there are a few general fixes I had to apply, and then I said, okay, wait a second, we're doing something wrong in the caching. We're using the package name as the cache file. But if I build for, um, if I have a multi-lib configuration build for my 32-bit and my 64-bit at the same time, I'm having to process everything twice. If I'm building something for my host system and my target system, and it happens to be the same source code, I'm, build, I'm processing these files twice. So a really simple optimization was use a different name, and that's uh, the BPN if you're familiar with uh, the Octo project. And then finally, if we do have to process the same thing multiple times, uh, we weren't locking, and so if we hit hit the thing at the same time, we would end up still processing three or four copies of something. And then when they came back, they would all overwrite each other. And so a simple lock file was all that was added. And so this is the first results that I got. And from what I've been told, I'm one of the few people that has actually run this outside of UNO. Um, so the first set of graphs, uh, hey, I can use a laser pointer. First set of graphs, uh, the dark blue is the real time that it took to execute the um, build. Um, so in this case, it was about 25 minutes. The um, light green, I guess it is up here, uh, that's the user time, and the light blue is the system time. So this is really our benchmark right here. As soon as I turned on the system to be able to call this remote physiology server and start doing processing, and I did not do any copyright uh, filtering, I only pulled for license information. Um, the uh, user and the system time stayed about the same on the build server, but the real time jumped way up to a little over 200 minutes. Now I'm going to activate the copyright scanning, and suddenly we're way up to 500 minutes. And so it's a very long process. This is not something you would want to do on every single build that you ran through, unless you were using the cache as well. And if you notice, um, both of these two results use the output of the two caches and they're almost identical to the no SPDX run. So, like I said, the, these guys are really good at the data transformation. They're really good at figuring how to read and process the data. And so, the, most of the additional work in these two places is data transforms, but it didn't slow down the build process, which I'm actually quite impressed by. I was expecting to add probably another 10 to 20% on the build, and it just didn't do it. Okay. First performance enhancement, because I said, okay, I'm watching the screen and I'm looking at this thing and it just does not look like it's doing anything. And the first thing I said is, okay, where is the first blockage in the system? And so I added an experimental change. I removed all the native packages. And if you're unfamiliar, there's really three main types of packages in the system. We have native packages. These are things that we build on your host system in order to support cross-compiling. We have target packages. These are the things you're going to ship with the target to a customer, potentially. And also uh, SDK items. And the SDK items are things that you would ship to an application developer. Um, natives are never shipped in the normal case. And so as part of the experiment, I remove the natives from this because I don't care about the licensing as a developer because I'm not going to give it to somebody else. So I don't have to worry about that part of the licensing. So if we do that, you'll see that the graphs drop. Um, the no native drops a little bit. It's about 10%. The um, copyright one actually drops pretty significantly. It takes about 40 minutes off the build. And off of 500 minutes, 40 is pretty good. Um, and again, the cached versions don't really change. And so I didn't add them to the graph because it's very quick as it is. OK, but if you look at the workflow, we are blocking the system as we go through. As soon as it gets to the SPDX generation, tars it up, sends it to the server, and again, goes back to something that needs to change in their design, is it posts the data up to the server, it keeps the connection open, and it waits for the data, the response to come back. And a 500 minute parse through GCC, it 
has the connection open for a very long time. And obviously we all know that doesn't, that's not a good thing in the end. So they're gonna be reworking that so that it pushes the data up, closes the connection, pulls occasionally until it gets a response and then pulls the data down. But the point is that we are blocking the build here and you get into deadlock situations. And so my change was instead of doing it all in one, one shot and blocking, let's try doing it in two, two individual components. We still run through the steps in the same order. We just happen to now prepare the source code so that we know it has not been modified from the patched. We then unblock the system, allow it to start com compiling, and then in parallel with the system, we then send it up and wait for the response so that we can later process the SPDX information. And what we got from that is a significant drop, much more than I was thinking it would be. So in the copyright case, we're suddenly under 400 minutes. So that's, uh, it's amazing difference and it's all because of the, the processing time for um, GCC and the kernel. So my results from this, the biggest problem right now that we have on the physiology side is performance. Um, us build engineer guys are always trying to make the build faster so that people have to wait less. And the cache is great, but on that initial build, it is painful. Um, again, Physology is very, very single threaded and somebody's got to step in and give these guys some help and, and figure that part out. Um, long, long connection times because of the processing overhead. And currently if the connection closes, the system automatically retries, which means if you have a timeout of four hours and it takes five hours to process something, at four hours the connection closes, it then says, oh, I'm sorry, and it sends the data back up to the server and starts over. And it will keep doing that forever until you run out of memory on the server. It's not a great thing. And like I said, they understand this. I've explained it to them. They're going to try to fix it. Um, but they're not web server designers. They're data processing guys. On the Yocto project side, um, we have a problem that we discovered. We have recipes that do not have archived source code. They have individual files which are copied into the destination location, or they have source code that is generated in place and compiled, very, very tiny apps. However, because they have no upstream software that was unpacked and patched, there is no source code to be scanned, and so you get an error generated. So we have to do something within the Yocto project to identify this information, make sure that we can key off of or change those recipes so that is no longer a valid way to do it, so that whatever source is going to be compiled is processed and sent upstream. And finally, the uh, Yocto project has a thing called the S-state cache. And what this is for is it's basically to optimize the build. If you haven't made any changes since the last time you built, all I should have to do is uncopy, uh, un unpack a copied version of that component and I can start as far into the system as I can. The uh, SPDX stuff does not yet work with the S-state cache. So if you have cached components, it's going to completely skip the S-state or the SPDX processing and you won't get that information out of the system. We will be working on fixing that sometime in the 1.6 development cycle for the Yocto project. Future work. And this is probably where um, most people are really going to start looking in, and into this stuff and making it useful. On the Physology SPDX side, they understand that the machine generated components is not good enough. It's good, it's the starting point. It's good enough probably for developers to get started with this and make good decisions on can I use this component or can't I? But it's not enough, in my opinion, to release your software. So they're going to be generalizing um, many of the services beyond the Yocto project uh, so that they could be used by BuildRoot or they could be used by SUSE's build system or Fedora's build system or whomever's build system, but the Yocto project is just their testing ground. Um, they're also going to be integrating the service uh, as part of those build systems um, as they find people to help them do it or as they find desire to do it. And this is all part of the overall SPDX initiative. Um, for the human part of the thing, they are creating a system they're calling currently the dashboard. And what this does is it interfa interfaces with the physiology side and gets the data back, caches the data, and provides a web interface to view the cache data and make manual changes to it and track those changes. So that you can do first run your automated system, 
go through it, okay, then, then you can get your lawyers involved and say, I've picked these 50 packages over here, 50 sources to use. You'll, the lawyers will be able to go to the dashboard or engineers or reviewers or whomever, view the stuff in context and actually make tweaks, comments, changes to it in order to be able to say, hey, this is really what I want. Part of the design behind this isn't that it also has to be physiology. This data could come from Black Duck or any other commercial source as well. And so you get into a situation where you can get a centralized repository of licensing data so that you can help check this stuff. The lawyers can flag things and say, hey, don't ever use this piece of software. I can't verify it. I don't accept it, et cetera. And it can help the developers very early on in the process avoid legal bugs in their software. And obviously, performance improvements are a big thing that the physiology guys need to work on. Um, the, the global SPDX, sorry, there is a global SPDX cache um, as it's processing, and if something goes wrong, it just leaves the files there. Well, we can't do that, because if we're running off a RAM disk, we're gonna run out. Um, we need to make sure that as the processing occurs, we're cleaning up after ourselves, that the, um, the long connection time is not a long connection time, it's whatever it takes to post it, whatever it takes to pull it down, and we clean up after ourselves. Um, Multi-processing, I keep mentioning it, and it is something that the, that Physology is going to have to move to, and the Physology SPDX integration is going to have to better uh, schedule itself, because it's simply, it, it takes too long, and it's unreasonable unless you just wanna go off and say, start this on a Friday and come back on Monday and cross your fingers that it's done. Based on those other charts I had, um, my guess is that if you built a large system like the Sato image, it would probably take about three to four days to process all the source code. And that's not a good way to start a project, is to start a build and come back three days later and see if what you built worked. Yocta project, on the other hand, we've got slightly different requirements. We're not pushing the SPDX, we're pushing the traceability of the software. And so this is my personal vision of what I think the Octo Project should be doing. And so far I've gotten pretty good buy-in from the, the Octo Project folks. Um, the idea in the end is that we need end-to-end -end traceability within the system. We need to be able to, uh, well, what we have in this now is we can trace the, um, oh, the original sources to a license. And that's pretty much it. The Octo Project has a way that you can trace the packages to the binaries and potentially the binaries to the overall source that the system has. But it can't do individual, this binary used these 15 source files, so I can read my SPDX files and know these are the 15 SPDX entries that match my binary. We need to get that traceability. We also want to get the traceability that the image contains, these packages contains these binaries, these binaries contain these sources, these sources are these licenses. And so you can print out a definitive list of my image contains the following sources, my lawyers have looked at this and said, my responsibilities are I must release these 15 things of source code, I must buy five guys beers because that's what the license says, and I've got to notify these other four people that I've shipped their software. And I've notified the customer of my written offer for the GPL and, and everything else. And that's the end goal that we really have, is to automate this process of going through it and telling people what they have to do to be compliant with the licensing based on these SPDX files. We're not gonna make a legal determination. Um, that's not the point. It really comes down to give you the information so that your organizations can, can do what they believe is correct under the laws. And future work for the Octo Project, more concrete future work, I should say is um, we gotta fix the SDA cache. We've gotta make sure that we integrate that JSON uh, temp files into the, SPD, into the SDATA information so that we don't have to regenerate all the way from source. We can start at the, the binary component if there's a change there. Or we can start on another level up if there's a change there. I've already talked to Richard Purdy, the maintainer of OE Core, and he's already told me how to do it. So I figure this work will probably be pretty quick within the 1.6 um, development cycle. Uh, within the Yocto project, we may want to come up with some tools that allow humans to, e to more easily um, modify and review these SPDX files because it's very beneficial to us. And if you're not familiar with the Yocto project very much, uh, one of our goals is to create tools that anybody in the embedded space can use, not even folks, uh, not necessarily folks that are using Open Embedded um, in the Yocto project uh, distribution creation. So if we can get to a point where, where our members are seeing that the tooling 
to modify, review, um, visualize um, SPDX correlations, license correlations comes in, that would be a really good place for us to, um, to start working. Uh, to go with the end-to-end -end configuration, we have to have a concrete way that we can do um, binary license determinations. So do we come up with some automated tools or do we allow plugins so that others can come up with automated tools so that we can say, this binary use these 15 sources, these 15 sources have this license, this is the aggregated license that, we, that it probably is for that binary so that we can um, give you binary information. And that goes back to the BusyBox problem. What is the license of BusyBox? And the only way you can make a determination is to figure out what your configuration is and what source files you used. Um, and then finally, roll that up into the image. These are the binaries I've included. These are the licenses of those binaries. This is now in my image. These are probably my obligations. And then you can get that information to be able to figure that out. And again, um, more tools. We need to have tools to work with SPDX files. Um, and right now, the, the really the tools are a text editor or a tag value set. Some people have some Excel scripts, which is great for the lawyers, but I don't want to use them. Um, so these are all things that, that the Yocta project can be involved with, but I'd like to see others work on these things as well. I mean, this is very, very valid in the workstation environment. It's valid in the server environment. It's valid for other embedded systems, uh, even commercial systems, because it's um, the common language for specifying these things. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions uh, about the licensing issues? Yes. Yeah, the uh, question is, is the presentation going to be available? I've already sent it to the ELC folks, and um, so they should be posting this shortly if they have not already. And I wanted to make sure this goes out. If you have any questions, you can certainly email me. Um, I, I'm happy to answer questions about the technical side and give you opinions. Like I said, I can only give you opinions because I'm not a lawyer, but it's, I've been doing this type of work for a couple of different companies. I've been doing, I've been helping lawyers understand what the open source people mean when they write certain things so that they can make the determination on what they need to figure out, what they need to learn, and how potentially they need to do this stuff in the future. Yes? Uh, does for solid G do any caching that you can supply just with a hash without giving the tag file and it will give you information? Yeah, the uh, question was, does Phosology do any caching so that all you have to do is give it hashes and you don't have to send all the files up and wait for the processing? Um, the main Phosology has some mechanisms for sending data up and it will store the results. I do not know if they can be retrieved by hash or they have to be retrieved by the, the initial package. The Phosology SPDX module does not use that mechanism at all. It only uses the underlying scheduler and processing mechanisms. And so it is a one-time thing. My understanding is it was designed as a one-time uh, processing mechanism, specifically because um, people that are using it may have proprietary sources that they're processing, and they don't want them cached. Yeah, but you don't have to cache the source, just the hash and the results. Correct. You don't have to cache the sources, but they don't want, but they're, they're erring on the side of caution on the, on the physiology side. But the dashboard should be able to plug in in the middle and act as a cache. And so the, that, that middle point would be able to go in. You'd potentially push either the hashes or the tarball to the dashboard, and the dashboard would then look up the hashes. They've already been processed, and it's going to short circuit that and return back potentially human modified data, which is the goal. But the, the dashboard only exists right now as a static web page um, just to get an idea of what people would like. I have no idea what their schedule is on implementing it, unfortunately. But I'm, I'm guessing it will be a year or so. Yes? Uh, if I understand this correctly, um, is this similar, the pathology, is it similar to, for example, Blackduck yeah, complex? Um, I have never used the Blackduck stuff. My, oh, sorry. The, the question is, is this similar to Blackduck, the pathology item? And I have never used Blackduck myself. And so keep my comments. Have you? Oh, yeah. OK, well, <laughs> there's a mic right beside you. Yeah, you can, you can help me answer this question. So, uh, this is a tough one. <laughs> well, follow up on that one is uh, how good is it in 
terms of like the what equal. Right. So Black Duck matches source code to other source code um, and then tells you if you know if you have that. It I think what I'm not sure what... So Physology is, uh, if you've ever used any of the Bayesian filters for spam filtering and things like that, it does a lot of that type of, of identification. Well, what's, it, it, what's it spitting out exactly? It's, well, it's, I don't even know what the format is that it finally spits out. It's because I don't see it until it gets to the SPDX format. Yeah. But, yeah, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you answer. <laughs> Yeah. Which is trying to extract anything that looks like a license or a copyright. Yep. Right. Yeah, so I'll repeat that just to make sure everybody heard. Um, basically, Physology's purpose is to scan. And it's to scan for keywords, it's to scan for other things that look like a license, look like a copyright. And where Protects IP is matching code. Yeah, versus Protects IP, which is at the at bottom, it is an anti plagiarism tool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's the best I've heard it described because I've always, I have a good idea of what Black Duck does and how it does it, but I've never heard anybody explain it quite that good. It's basically, he said Black Duck is an anti-plagiarism tool, and I think that's, that's excellent. That's great summary. And yeah, it's a great summary. It's very short and sweet you know, compared to some I've heard. Um, the, the issue is there are things, especially when processing proprietary software in this mechanism, that Black Duck would be excellent for because it would be able to look for these things, look for telltale signs of the plagiarism and add that to the SPDX information. Because sometimes the plagiarism is acceptable, it's public domain, it's BSD, whatever. But you want that information as a lawyer to pull this stuff in so that you can make the determination that my engineers did the work correctly, or at least legally. Um, and, then it, it, and then you can augment that with something like the physiology, like the manual reviews to be able to get the actual determination of the license and get the information the lawyer needs to be able to make the right determination uh, legally for product shipment or whatever. And every time I talk about this stuff, I always want to say legal is no different than any technical bug. It's a bug if the system isn't put together right. And the only way to make this a cheap bug is that you want to find these problems early in your development and you want to make smart decisions as a developer and avoid the problems later on because the lawyers never see the product until the product is supposed to ship. And then unfortunately, that just seems to be the way it works. And it's just like documentation people, they don't get the documentation notes until a day before it's supposed to ship. And so let's give, my opinion is let's empower the engineers to make smart decisions so that they can help the lawyers understand why they made technical decisions in lawyer language. Because when you talk to a lawyer, nobody's speaking the same language. And as long as you can do that and you can avoid introducing the bugs into your system early, it's going to save money, it's going to save time, it's going to save effort, and it's going to save a lot of annoyance when you have to re-implement 15 APIs and you have a week before you're supposed to ship. Um, so, I, I, so I see this as one small piece of the tool, but it's the first step that we have to take in order to, to get to that next level of, of processing. So, uh, yeah, you're out. You mentioned on your last slide that you want to support human generated SPDX files and Docker as well. Yep. So, this is also a good, uh, good the scenario that the upstream project is providing SPDX, where we are hopefully going for. Yep. In the, um, so, the question was about supporting the human generated SPDX. In, in the early, uh, earlier today in the Yachter project OE Core Birds of a Feather session, uh, somebody stood up and said, hey, I'm, I'm working on U-Boot, and we're trying to put this stuff in the headers of the thing. And that's exactly what we want. Yeah, that, that is the ultimate goal of the SPDX community, is we want people to tag their source code in a way that we can just take the tags right out of the source, generate the SPDX, and there is no pattern matching. There is none of this fuzzy logic. We know that that is what the author intended. We know that everybody who has patched that source code, that is what they intended. 
and it, it solves the problem of having to review the code into a problem of just simply reviewing the licenses. And that is a much easier problem to solve in the end. And so if somebody like U-Boot starts this process, comes up with something very, very useful, then hopefully others will look at it and go, yeah, I can do that too. I can add a five lines to every file because I'm already adding the license statement anyway. And it just becomes a lot easier in the end. How do you handle um, linking with a library that changes your license? question is, how do you handle linking with a library that, that could potentially change the license? Um, that's not handled in what's done so far, because what's done so far is, is focused purely on the source code. The one of the next steps is to do that determination of what source is made up a binary. And there's two linkage cases, uh, one of which is a dynamic link cage, case. And that will require simply tools that say, hey, this thing's dynamically linking to this other thing, and note it in some fashion. The hard case, though, is this thing is statically linking to this other thing. And I need to know that so that I can make the determination if my binary is OK. Um, there are some tricks that we can do in order to determine what it's statically linking against. And as an engineer that, that's used to debugging software, you've probably used them before, and it's called dwarf symbols. Your dwarf symbols already have a reference for every line of code you compiled back into the sources. And if we read those dwarf symbols out, and we go, this file used these 15 source, sources, and we can correlate those sources back to the original source, which can then be correlated through the SHAs into the SPDX files. We can determine what the license is of the binary. And that includes conflicting licenses. I don't know if you will ever see a tool, at least I won't be creating one for multiple reasons, that um, would tell you, hey, your license is conflicting. Um, but you, this would give the information to the lawyers to make that determination. And, and so if, if you're not familiar in the US, we have um, a law basically, if you're not a lawyer, you can't give legal advice or you can be sued. Um, and this is especially true for companies. And so if somebody creates a tool in the US that says these two licenses conflict, or these two licenses, more to the point, don't conflict, and somebody relies on that tool, the author is potentially liable. And so you won't see a tool like that from us, from the company I work for, from myself. I, it's just, it's not worth the effort, but I will give you all of the data you need to either write the tool yourself or to um, give it to a lawyer and have them review it and make the determination on your behalf. But you, will not, uh, you won't likely see a tool that says these two are incompatible because, or, or they are compatible, more to the point, because it's, it's making a legal determination in the US. Uh, it might is not good enough when it comes to lawyers. <laughs> it's, exactly. And, and I would not be surprised if you did see tools that were programmable that went in and said, okay, I have my, my detected or concluded field that says GPL and BSD and, and, and proprietary. Wait a second. There's, th there's two licenses here, which I have programmed for my organization as being a red flag. That I would expect there would be tools that people will come up with and commercialize and everything else. But the determination of what those thing, those combinations are that are or are not allowed would probably, at least in the US, end up being uh, determined either by the lawyer of the organization or through some type of a lawyer community within, within the organization, people that are willing to make the legal determination take the liability behind the, their answers. So it's a, it's a problem, and it's a problem that as engineers are like, this is simple. We can just do pattern matching, and we can ands, ors, and all the rest of it. But it's easy for us. It's not so easy when it comes to liability. So any, any other questions? Yes? Uh, you sent the batch to sources. Yes. But actually, any uh, licensing of the patch itself is not in the patch sources anymore, but only in the, in the patch itself. The uh, question is talking about patch sources and licensing the patches. I have seen patches that have licenses specified in two ways. Um, one way, which I consider incorrect, is in the header of the patch. 
the correct way to patch the source if you are adding a license or a copyright is to actually have the copyright or the license information as part of the, um, the code change. And that's how the physiology and how we've set up the system so that uh, we process after the patch is applied. So if the patch adds a copyright statement or changes the license from GPL2 to GPL3, we catch the patched version of it because the patched version is what we are going to compile into the binary. Yes, but you only uh, catch one case. Um, w yes, we only catch one of the two cases and from an organizational review point, um, it's important that when you review the patches themselves to be checked in, you don't, people don't do that. And this, this patch makes this thing GPL version three. Um, in the Yocto project, we would never allow somebody to make a patch like that. Um, the, the most that we have done within the OE core Yocto project is we had a component that was listed as GPL version three in the software. It was a component that we wanted to use and did not want the GPL version three, some of those exclusions on it. We contacted the original author and we said, are we allowed to change this one component? Can we get permission from you? And there was only one author, so we didn't have to go to a community, one author. And the person said, I understand why you want to do this. Yes, you have permission and your users may use it as a GPL version two. We sent them a copy of the patch we created, which is the header of the patch is the email conversation we had granting us permission. And the patch itself actually changes the line in the license file to GPL v2. Again, he reviewed it, signed off on it, and that's what got checked in. So not only did we add the comment explaining why we were allowed to do it, but we also had the actual change in the code. So that's the only one that I know of that we have ever allowed a license change within the sources within the patches. Um, the common case, though, is somebody would be backporting something from a newer version. And in that case, they really are responsible for backporting the license statement as well, if, if the license changed or is revised or the copyrights changed or revised. And it's, that becomes more of a procedural point on the developer. And there is nothing perfect about it. And this is one of the cases where something like Black Duck would be very good because they could look at the patches and say, hey, this thing came from this thing over here, potentially, and be able to find that that type of a, a, a plagiarism. I mean, it's not really plagiarism because it's probably documented, but the, the idea being that you would be able to determine that this came from a GPL version three thing and I inserted it into GPL version two needs to be investigated by somebody. So we are almost to the end of the session. Um, if anybody has any further questions or one-on-one -on -one stuff, um, they scheduled me down uh, in the Intel booth to answer individual questions. Uh, they're calling it a chalk talk, but basically I'm going to stand there and if you have any questions about this or the Octo project or anything else, I'm happy to answer them. So um, I'll see you guys down there in a few minutes if you have any questions. <laughs>